Hello, everyone, and welcome to Singularity University's Experts on Air webcast. Uh, today, our guest is Robert Mugga, who is joining us from Rio, Brazil today. Um, we're really excited you all could join us. I'm Sada McShane, I'll be your moderator. Um, for those of you who are new to Singularity University, our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower leaders to apply exponential technologies to address humanity's grand challenges. We do this through both in-person and digital programs, projects, and events all around the world. Um, with these webcasts, we're bringing you experts from all around the SU community to present on a variety of topics across all of SU's exponential domains. Uh, some of our upcoming topics include the future of robotic surgery, reducing the threat of nuclear weapons. So for those of you who are new, I want to show you around LiveStorm. I see everyone saying hi. We've got some people from Brazil, where Robert is, great. We've got some people from India, from San Francisco, from France, from Chile. Awesome. Um, so right there where you guys are saying hello um, at the chat section, feel free to introduce yourselves, feel free to say hello, feel free to just converse throughout the presentation. If you have a specific question for Robert, please drop it in the questions tab. I will be looking there to curate some of the questions for our Q&A session. Um, you'll also see the polls area. If you click on that, you'll see that um, we have some polls coming up that we'll be posting throughout the presentation. So with that, I want to take a minute to introduce Robert to everyone. Um, Robert specializes in city security, migration, conflict, and new technologies. He co-founded the Igarape Institute, a think and do tank working on data-driven safety across justice and justice across Latin America and Africa. He also co-founded the SecDev Foundation and group, groups that are devoted to cybersecurity and stability in the Middle East and Eurasia and South Asia regions. Uh, he serves on the UN Secretary General appointed panels and helps convene a range of international networks including the Global Parliament of Mayors. He sits on the Council for Cities and Urbanization for the World Economic Forum. He is a regular consultant to the UN, World Bank, and several firms ranging from Google to McKinsey. He publishes regularly with The Guardian, Foreign Affairs, Globe and Mail, O Globo, LA Times, New York Times, Wired, and is a speaker at the Global City Expo, the Chicago Council, the World Economic Forum in Davos, and TED in 2015, 2016, 2017. So uh, I'm so excited to have Robert here today, and I'm going to hand it over to him now for his presentation. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um. Well, first of all, bon dia, everybody. Hello, uh, buenos dias. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I really have just one central message that I want to convey to you uh, today, and it's this. If we design our cities right, uh, we just might make it through the 21st century. Uh, if we get them wrong, we're toast. Um, I'm going to divide my presentation really into two parts. Uh, the first, I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on some of the major risks that we're facing around the world, both um, risks that are internal to cities as well as risks that are external to cities. Then I'm going to focus on some of the solutions and the ways that cities are addressing some of these risks and fighting back. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you in a really short period of time, so please bear with me. Uh, but uh, to explain some of these challenges we're facing, I'm going to use two big data visualizations that I've been involved in, in developing. The first is called Fragile Cities, and it's a platform developed by the EGAPA Institute together with uh, a startup actually in San Francisco called XSEER, uh, the United Nations, and a whole bunch of other partners. And the second data visualization I'm going to show you is called Earth Time Lapse, and this was developed by Carnegie Mellon University's Create Lab uh, together with my institute and a whole bunch of just extraordinary uh, partners. Um, I'll dive into some of these tools as we go along. It'll become clear what I'm explaining uh, as we move forward. Um, but before I jump into the discussion on cities, let me talk a little bit about the big picture to set things up. Um, and to do that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So let's talk about the obvious. 
we live in a world of nation states. Um, this may seem somehow hard to believe when you think about it. Uh, and it's always been like this, that we've lived in this world of nation states. Uh, it's not always been like this, sorry, that we've lived in the world of nation states. We're actually taking part in a four century long experiment that really kicked off in 1648. Uh, from the beginning, this nation state idea was immensely popular. Uh, for one, it ended two horrible wars uh, during the 1600s that lasted for decades. But more fundamentally, it led to a whole new global order defined on the one hand by national sovereignty and on the other hand by non-interference. Uh, over time, nation states have been quite extraordinary in terms of unifying identities of many peoples, of strengthening borders where previously there was violent contestation, for also organizing tax systems out of really banditry. Uh, nations have been incredible at essentially organizing our political, economic, and social lives, pulling millions of people out of poverty, scaling up education and health, uh, and much more. But nation states haven't been without their problems. They are at the root of devastating wars that have cost tens of millions of lives. Uh, and whether you like them or not, nation states are actually experiencing a kind of decline right now. They're not going to disappear, but they're weakening fundamentally. And one of the reasons for that is globalization which is reducing their power. The speeding up of capital, labor, communications is actually reducing state autonomy. The other reason nation states are losing their mojo is because societies have changed. More to the point, we've been changing our address. When nation states were first formed in really the 1600s, when they came into being in a meaningful sense, less than 1% of the world's population lived in cities. Today, it's closer to 54%. Uh, and by 2050, it's going to be closer to 70%. So we're seeing a decline in nation states all over the map in terms of their influence. And they're struggling to deal and deliver the goods to citizens, especially citizens in cities. Uh, nation states just aren't sufficiently agile today to deal with some of the most extraordinary social challenges and economic challenges that are of our time. Whether this is climate change, whether this is pandemics, whether this is the fourth industrial revolution, whether this is terrorism or even nuclear threats, we're seeing nation states clinging to quite parochial ideas of sovereignty. Uh, and it's not just nation states that are suffering and struggling. It's also our international institutions. Uh, if you think about it, the United Nations, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, these organizations are really stuck. They're paralyzed, partly because nation states themselves are also stuck. So I want you, as part of this session today, to start reimagining our world, not through the lens of nation states, uh, but through the lens of cities. We are, after all, an urban species. Uh, we are homo urbanus. Uh, just think about it. Four billion of us currently live in, in cities today. And that's going to grow to more than six billion in the next two decades. And these trends are literally baked in. This map right here shows you every single city in the world with a population of 250,000 people or more. It's the first ever map that actually puts all cities onto literally and figuratively onto one page. Without going into technical detail, and I will in a moment, um, the red of the city, the more fragile it is, the bluer, the more resilient. And these cities around the world are growing, not just in number, but they're growing in size. This rapid expansion is not evenly distributed. You know, essentially 90% of all future population growth in the world in the next 20 to 30 years is going to be taking place in Africa and Asia. Just three countries, China, India, and Nigeria, are going to account for 40% of all future urban population growth. Meanwhile, in North America and Western Europe and in Japan, we're actually seeing cities stabilize in size. In fact, we're seeing some cities declining in size. So this mega expansion of cities, this turbo urbanization we're going to be seeing over the coming decades uh, is not going to be restricted to hyper cities or super cities or, or mega cities, as mesmerizing as these cities are. In fact, there are more than 30 mega cities today. No, the vast majority of population growth that's going to take place in the coming 20 to 30 years is going to be happening with people moving from rural areas into medium sized cities and large cities. It's less spectacular, but it's much more significant. We're also going to see a huge expansion of people moving into slums. The, the current slum population right now is about 1.2 billion people. 
It's expected to be 2 billion by 2030. So we have 193 nation states in the world today, but there are also hundreds of cities, as you can see, that are beginning to grow and rival them in power and influence. Cities like Tokyo, uh, with 34 million people in the metropolitan area, have economies and GDPs of more than $2 trillion a year. New York, with its 8.5 million people, has an economy of 1.5 trillion. That makes it larger than all but the largest of nation states. And they're not alone. Cities today account for more than 75% of global GDP. So all things considered, cities are probably humanity's most successful experiment in social engineering in our history. If you're lucky enough to live in a city, and even if you live in a slum, and 20% of the world's urban population does, you're gonna be healthier, wealthier, better educated, and live longer than your country cousins. And that partly explains why three million people are moving to cities every single week. Cities are where the future happens first, but they have a dark side. Now, cities take up, as you can see, just 3% of the world's surface area, but they count for more than 75% of our energy consumption. They generate over 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And hundreds of thousands of people are dying every single year in our cities from crime and violence. And according to the latest studies, about a fifth of the world's mortality is due to pollution-related causes, most of it affecting our cities. These challenges are especially acute in those parts of the world that are growing the fastest, especially in Africa and in Asia. What you see here is a temporal overview of which cities are facing the most risks. So what is city fragility? Well, city fragility occurs when we see convergence of different risks. And what this platform does in front of you is it tracks 10 key risks for every single city. We selected these variables on the basis of both their empirical validity, but also whether that data is available for a large cross-section of cities. And these include things like population growth, inequality in terms of gene inequality, access to electricity, homicide, terrorism, exposure to floods, cyclones and earthquakes, and more. And we developed a composite index ranking every single city on a scale of zero to four. What this map shows us is that all cities are fragile to greater or lesser degree. Some cities clearly experience more fragility than others, especially in parts of Africa and Asia. And there is good news. And the good news is that cities can and do often exit from high levels of fragility. Unfortunately, though, there's a little bit more bad news than good. First, what we see is that fragility tends to be highly concentrated, as mentioned, in large parts of Africa and Asia. And this shows you a progression of fragile cities, of fragility in cities over the last 15 years. These are cities that score in the upper thresholds of fragility. Um, and it's happening faster in lower income and middle income settings than in upper income settings, but it's a global phenomenon. We're also seeing, even in those cities that are ostensibly resilient, the blue cities, an increasing amount of fragility. This is a 2001 frame, and as you go over time, you'll see the number of cities that are classified as resilient diminishing over time in the last 15 years. Uh, the third point is that it's obvious, but different factors are driving fragility in different parts of the world. In the Middle East and Central, and, and, and Central Asia, it tends to be a combination of turbo urbanization and terrorism, which tends to tip cities over into a higher level of fragility. If you zoom over over to Central America and South America, you'll see it's a combination of inequality, uh, homicide, and natural disasters, which also contributes to city fragility, including in places like Brazil. So this is a, just a quick overview of some of the internal risks facing cities. Now I wanna flip over and talk about some of the external factors that are affecting our cities. This time-lapse visualization stitches together 30 years of satellite data. And what we've added is a series of filters on both environmental and anthropomorphic risks that are facing our world. Uh, and what I wanna show you here is the same data on fragile cities. These are represented by circles now, stitched onto a satellite map. And the key I wanna mention here is that as cities become more fragile, we also see them connected to more explosive forms of population movement. Cities that are fragile both produce increased amounts of, of, of out migration, but they're also fragile when they receive large mass amounts of migration at the same time. And we're seeing this particularly in parts of North Africa, the Middle East, and now increasingly in Europe. I want to talk to you briefly about refugees. 
Today, there are more than 22 million refugees in the world, more than at any other time since the middle of the 20th century. As you can see here, there isn't just one refugee crisis. There are multiple refugee crises, and they're spread out all around the world. The vast majority of refugees are moving from poor countries into wealthy countries, as is often made out in the international media. No, the vast majority of refugees are moving from poor countries and poor cities into even poorer cities. Just 10% of the world's refugees make it to the industrialized north. The vast majority are eking it out in neighboring countries. What you see here now is a filter of political violence, both terrorism and conflict, overlaid with a map of refugees. And there's two points I want to stress here. First, refugees are not bringing terrorism and political violence to cities, whether in their neighboring countries or to the West. Of the more than 800,000 refugees that were accepted by the United States that claimed asylum since 9-11, not one is associated with a fatal uh, event, a terrorist event on U.S. soil. But there is a relationship between political violence and refugees. Uh, and, terror uh, and basically, it's, it's not the direction that most people think. For the most part, refugees are fleeing from terrorism. Now, each of these dots on this map represents a story of struggle and survival. But it's also important to signal what's not on that map, and that's internally displaced people. You see, there's more than 36 million people who are internally displaced as of last year, and the numbers keep rising. And this puts enormous stress on cities. I want to take you to Syria, just to give you an example of how this plays out in real life. What you see here in Syria is fragile cities superimposed on a map with refugees. Now, Syria's been battered by waves of instability over the last decades. Following the 2003 invasion from, of Iraq, Iraqi refugees flooded into large parts of Syrian cities. And we saw a sharp increase in 2005, 2006, with major strains on cities in Syria. The situation got much worse from around 2007 to 2010, when large parts of the interior, the most fertile parts of Syria, witnessed an extraordinary drought, which wiped out 75% of its agriculture and 85% of its livestock. 1.5 million internally displaced people moved to Syrian cities, putting enormous stress on these cities. And when price, prices for food began to rise, and we saw the Arab Spring begin to spread, we also saw President Assad crack down on, on cities, and the war kicked off in 2011, and all hell broke out. The war generated more than 5 million refugees leaving Syria. It generated 6 million internally displaced people inside Syria and 1.4 million people moved up towards Europe, as you can see. Now, climate change, not just drought, but also sea level rise, is probably the most significant existential threat facing cities today. Changes to our climate right now are literally reconfiguring how and where we live. They're reversing thousands of years of urban planning. This is because two thirds of the world's population is coastal. More than 1.5 billion people live in what are called low-lying coastal areas. And the latest studies are predicting that even if we achieve the Paris Climate Agreement target of 2 degrees Celsius temperature, global sea levels are likely going to rise in the next couple of decades. Climate scientists are predicting anywhere between 3 and 30 feet of increase in our lifetimes. We can expect storm surges, flooding. We can expect salinization of arable land destruction of water res res reserves, and of course, climate displacement. And it's coming a lot faster than we thought. What this visualization I'm showing you here demonstrates is what happens to cities when sea levels start to rise. Now, this is based on a predictive algorithm that was developed by Climate Central, and it shows a temperature change of between zero and four degrees Celsius in the bottom left corner. So what you're seeing is an expected impact depending on changes in temperature. Obviously, some parts of the world are going to be dramatically more affected than others. That was Shanghai. I'm going to take you right now to Dhaka. It's not just island nation states like the Solomon Islands or Kiribati or the Maldives or Sri Lanka that are under threat, and they are under threat. It's also megacities across Asia. Cities like Dhaka, Shanghai, Hong Kong are literally going to disappear. They're going to need to adapt or they will die. Of course, it's not just Asia. It's also cities across Western Europe. If you, go up towards, uh, if you go up towards The Hague, Rotterdam, but also Amsterdam and London, you're going to see what happens when sea levels uh, begin to rise. Financial hubs, global cities are literally going to be wiped out. Now, 
Many of you in the States will, of course, be very familiar with what's been going on in the Gulf Coast. And we've seen what's happened to cities like Houston, New Orleans, and Miami, built as they are on swamps, and the impacts of rising sea levels on those parts of the world. These cities have already experienced dramatic floods and storm surges. Uh, but that's just really a warm up for what's to come. What you're looking at here is the prediction for Miami, depending on a zero to four degrees temperature rise. And as we scale out, you'll see the situation's not much better for islands and, and coastal areas in this nearby area. Carbon emissions play a really big role in the story, of course. Um, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're both producing carbon emissions in cities, but cities are also badly affected by them. But it's carbon emissions that are heating up the cities ultimately and contributing to this rising level of sea rise. Uh, what I also want to show you here is basically another satellite visualization. Um, this is developed from a Japanese satellite that captures fires at night. What you see here is light that's captured from space over a three year period. Uh, this data is quite recent. It takes you up to, the, in fact, last month. Um, and what you can see here is just how monumental are the impacts of, of human intervention uh, on our world. And I just want to highlight a few patterns here. Um, the first pattern I want to highlight is basically Sub-Saharan Africa. This is about slash and burn. Um, and as you can see above and below the equator, a bloom of smoke and fire. Uh, and this is all about um, land being burnt to allow the green shoots of pasture to grow uh, for nomadic peoples. This is not so much a problem made by cities as a problem for cities. As we move towards Southeast Asia, a similar kind of pattern emerges with blooms above and below the equator. And you'll see this is a seasonal phenomenon, it's largely still a rural one. But we're also seeing massive generation of emissions from oil and gas wells and industrial development across major cities around the world. This image here takes you to uh, North Africa and the Gulf and gives you some sense of what's happening in and around Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Iraq and Iran, but also over Algeria. And as you can see where we have stable light patterns, these are actually flares. Another interesting phenomenon is if you go to the United States and see the revolution in shale and oil extraction across the United States. You'll see forest fires here and there, and it's becoming more and more, more of a problem, but you're also seeing massive oil fields all across the eastern seaboard uh, and Texas. If you go up here towards North Dakota, fascinating little cluster here, these are all burned from uh, oil and gas uh, drills, and, and basically what you're seeing is the equivalent of one million cars on the road every single year just from burn. You can also see the legacy of the steel industry across the United States, still on the fringes of metropolitan areas. And here we're going to Pittsburgh to see U.S. Steel, Amco, and Allegheny, and others operating along the metropolis. But it's really China. If you really want to understand what's happening, we want to go to China to see the sense and the monumental scale of steel production and its impacts on our cities. Uh, Tangshan is China's largest steel producing city. And the implications of all this pollution are staggering. China is already radically stepping up its fight against carbon. Uh, and it's launched a low carbon cities program to reduce coal, to build green buildings, reduce emissions through congestion pricing schemes, and much more. And we're seeing some early results. Now look, no city is an island. Every city is connected to its uh, rural hinterlands in complex ways, including in relation to food production. And I want to take um, to look at how deforestation has potentially implications for our cities. Industrial scale deforestation is affecting our planet. And what you see here is essentially a single road built through a donia state. And on either side, you'll see pasture land that's being produced for cattle, as well as land that's being cleared for soy. Uh, this is a single road, uh, but it's not just a single road in one corner of the state. In fact, it's multiple roads across the state. And you'll see that the scale is, all, is, is dramatic. And this is, this is being driven by insatiable demand, insatiable demand for food, not just in, in cities like Sao Paulo and Rio, near where I live, but also in China, in, in, in Europe, in North America. Now what you see here in red is areas where you've seen a net loss of forest over the last 14 years. If you look really hard, you might see a little bit of blue, and that implies there's been a net gain in the last 14 years. Um, you'll see that the scale is breathtaking, uh, and we're seeing a net loss of forests across Brazil over the last decades. Uh, this is generating a huge amount of release of carbon into the atmosphere, 
but it's also reducing the forest's ability to capture carbon in the long term. And this is not just affecting uh, essentially forest cover and oxygen release and carbon intake, it's also affecting cloud cover and groundwater levels. There's a real risk right now that we're going to create a tipping point from clear cutting where rainfall is going to be affected from which we will not recover. And we're already starting to see the early symptoms of this in Brazil. Droughts now are regularly affecting our major cities. The reservoirs of some of the biggest cities in this country have already gone well below their acceptable capacity, below 10%. Uh, in 20% of Brazil's major cities, we're seeing limits on water access, and this in a country with 20% of the world's global reserves. So the scenario is pretty grim, but all is not lost. I want to show you what happens when parks and protected areas are in introduced as well to this visualization. Brazil's wisdom has introduced a network, a lattice of different parks across the country. And what you can see is while not perfect, it has limited encroachment in certain areas. And it's not just in Brazil, but it's all around the world that we see parks playing a really important role as a frontline social policy intervention to limit uh, climate change. So while the future is uncertain, there are some solutions. And so here's my punchline. Cities can and must be part of the solution. And the good news is they're already taking action. You know, take the case of the recent Paris Agreement on climate change. 174 states got together, made some efforts to reduce carbon emissions by two degrees Celsius, which in and of itself is impressive, but still pretty timid as an objective. The real story were the 600 cities that also made their presence felt in Paris. And in the US alone, more than 337 cities have already said they're gonna meet those Paris Agreement targets and they're gonna move beyond them. And it's not just in the United States, of course. There are more than 684 cities representing 500 million people who've signed a global compact on committing to, glee, to clean energy. We're seeing a new politics of empowered cities emerging. Cities that are agitating for urban sovereignty, not necessarily for national sovereignty. And whether in defense of climate or undocumented migrants, we're seeing, including the United States, we're seeing cities step up and they're not asking for permission, they're taking action. Now there are a few ways that cities, I think, can design resilience to some of these internal and external threats that I've described. I want, to, I want to talk about five, and I'll quickly run through them, uh, that I've learned from speaking with hundreds of urbanists and, and mayors and, and planners from around the world. The first, cities need to set a plan and a vision and a means to implement that plan. It's remarkable, but very few cities have actually set up a vision or a plan for their city. Cities are just too busy putting out daily fires to think ahead and plan strategically. A plan that is a basic vision, some metrics, and a route to achievement is critical. Without it, you're flying blind. Again, painfully obvious, but extraordinary how few of our cities actually have one. I wanna take, a, take a, Singapore as a good example of how to do things right. Singapore set a 50-year urban strategy in 1971 and it updates it every five years to make sure it reaches its targets. Now, Singapore has a lot of things that many cities don't, but one thing, two things to stress about the Singaporean model. The first is continuity. So Singapore, the most successful cities set plans, enforce them, and work with multiple levels of government over time. They don't just jettison the plan every couple of years. The second point is autonomy. Cities need the discretion to tax, to issue debt, to take decisions with nation states, even when nation states get in the way. This isn't straightforward. It's gonna require cities to renegotiate the relationship with nation states. But if we don't start doing that now, especially in parts of Africa and Asia where cities are growing fastest, we're in for a whole lot of trouble. Second, go green. Cities are already leading the fight in terms of global decarbonization efforts. They are setting carbon emissions reduction targets. They're introducing congestion pricing schemes. They're investing in biodiversity. They're greening their buildings. In New York, they're even painting the rooftops white. They're zoning in parks. They're promoting sharing and digital economies. They're banning drilling and everything in between. Cities, counties, and states across the United States are also investing in wind and solar. And as you can see in this map, the blue dots are essentially wind turbines and the green dots are solar panels. You can see it's been spreading. And it's not just the United States. Across Europe and especially in China, we're seeing similar kinds of phenomena. There are more than 8,000 cities right now around the world that have solar plants that are powering at least part of the municipal grid. There are 1,000 cities that have hydroelectric plants 
And there's 300 cities right now, most of them in Europe, that have declared complete energy autonomy. The lesson here is that smart policies can incentivize smart investments in renewables. On the West Coast, as you can see in this map of the United States, Californian cities were early adopters. They were soon followed by cities on the East Coast. And then we saw the rest of America essentially jumping on board. But as you can see, if we zoom in on Texas, similar kinds of tendencies play out. Antonio, the capital, took the lead with solar power in the beginning. And it was followed soon by Fort Worth, two of the most populous cities in, in Texas. But as you can see, Houston on the far eastern coast is resisting. It's the biggest city in Texas, but also the least inclined to invest in renewables. It's oil country, after all, and policies favoring solar and wind simply aren't that welcome there. A third lesson is to build densely, but also sustainably. The death of any city, whether it's in North America or Western Europe, Africa, Asia, or elsewhere, is sprawl. What cities need to do is start building more densely and also more sustainably. Cities that are zoned right can, be, can save energy, they can reduce emissions, uh, they can be more livable, they can be safer. But we need to balance as well. Cities need to know when not to build so as not to reproduce these vertical sprawls, sprawls or slums of downward mobility. The way not to do it is Las Vegas. You see, Las Vegas has sprawled over the last 30 years. Just a tiny proportion of its population takes public transport to work. Virtually everybody else drives. People who live in Las Vegas spend 53 hours a year literally sitting doing nothing in traffic. It's the most populous U.S. metropolitan area without heavy rail or light rail, and yet it gets 42 million visitors a year, and as a result is one of the most congested cities in the United States. There was a time when U.S. cities got this right. You know, basically what I'm going to show you here very quickly though is a map with using U.S. census data that shows just how many people take cars to get to, to work. The yellow areas are essentially our households that use their car to get to work, and if you could see it, the green, the blue, and the purple are those who don't. Uh, they're using motor, motorcycles, taxis, uh, and, and otherwise. There was a time when U.S. got this balance right. I would show you New York, but it will take a bit too long to load. Uh, but it shows how when you have a properly integrated city with effective public transport and integrated public transport, uh, you actually get a much better balance and heterogeneous mix of people walking, biking, as well as taking public transport and driving to work. The fourth and second last lesson is to invest in integrated and multi-use solutions. The most successful cities are those that invest in solutions that don't just solve one problem, but solve multiple challenges. And I mentioned the case of integrated public transport. Well, rapid bus transit, when implemented well, uh, doesn't only reduce congestion and cut emissions, it can also improve public health by making more people take bicycles to work. It can reduce dispersion. It can increase overall well-being and make cities even safer by pr producing more predictable public transport. Seoul, Korea is an example of how to get things right. Seoul's population actually doubled in the last 30 years, but its footprint has barely moved. How? Well, 75% of the population of Seoul gets to work using what's been described as one of the greatest public transport systems in the world. They get to work by using public transport, by bikes, by boats. The final point I want to make is the importance of working in global coalitions. There's been an explosion of networks linking cities around the world, not just in the United States, but also across Europe, across Africa, uh, and Asia. There are currently more than 200 intercity networks uh, that are dealing with issues as wide ranging as welcoming refugees, to improving public safety, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and everything in between. There are currently more networks for cities than there are networks for nation states. The problem though, is that these city networks lack power. So one of the things I've been involved in the last couple of years is developing something called a Global Parliament of Mayors. It was launched in 2016 precisely to begin empowering cities to assume greater leadership and to speak with a common voice. While early days, this kind of parliament and other networks like it, the UCLG, the C40, ECLE, and, and others, could be a potent force at this time of global paralysis. 
What these global coalitions do, these global coalitions of cities do, is they can amplify city voice on the national and the global stage. And with a voice, eventually comes a vote and possibly a veto. Cities have the necessary upward and the downward accountability to lead a devolution revolution. And cities are especially well suited to lead this fight. Mayors, for those of you who know them, tend to be problem solvers. They're pragmatists, they're paradigmats. They like to get things done. So cities and leaders are, are busy solving some of the world's most intractable problems. The question really, I think for all of us and for you is how can we help them accelerate these changes? So I'll stop there. Awesome, awesome. Thank, thank you, you Robert. Robert. That, that was, was fantastic. fantastic. Oh, oh, there you go. go. Can you can hear, hear me? me? I can hear you. Awesome. Um, I was, I was just saying, saying that was fantastic. fantastic. Um, these visualizations are wonderful, and I've, I've seen, seen them once before, before and um, both times it's just, just uh, an incredible um, way of kind of uh, showing all this data. data. Uh, we we have, have, we have um, a lot of questions actually coming in asking about the visualization specifically and how you um how how you came to decide maybe what what defines fragility for example can you talk a little bit about that yeah so so fragility is um a concept that's emerged in the last decade or so to describe which first emerged to describe nation states and it was developed as an idea to understand states that weren't necessarily tipping into war but they were experiencing all sorts of difficulties in um, economic and social and political and, and other areas. Um, and so one of the concerns that I had and a, a large number of researchers had was that the, focusing at the nation state scale um, wasn't really getting at the level of granularity and resolution that we really needed if we wanted to understand truly what was going on in many countries uh, that were experiencing different kinds of volatility. Um, and so we just changed the referent. We wanted to focus primarily on cities as the primary entry point, since this is where the bulk of people increasingly tend to live. Um, and since cities are really the engines of, of many of these economies and certainly the political nerve centers, um, and also, of course, the technological uh, centers of many of these, these countries. Um, and so what we started to do is we want to understand what were the kinds of risks that were um, shaping volatility at that city scale. Um, and so, of course, what we first did was we turned to the literature. Uh, and we can visit a whole range of literature on the anthropomorphic and the, and the environmental side to see what were those independent variables that led to volatility uh, at the city scale. And what we discovered very quickly was that it wasn't necessarily simply a monolithic or a single risk, but that it had to be multiple risks and it was the interaction often of those risks that led to sort of cascading effects. It's very difficult, of course, uh, to look at all of that interconnectedness uh, because it's not a linear relationship in many cases. It's a, uh, but I think what we did was we, we canvassed a lot of the literature um, looking at violence um, and, and the way that terrorism, homicide, uh, and these kinds of things can contribute to the slowing down of economies, uh, can contribute to destabilizing governments. Uh, we looked at sudden natural disaster shocks, uh, earthquakes, cyclones, floods, and we looked at the way those can also contribute to volatility in the city. Um, we looked at, uh, of course, underlying economic variables um, like income inequality, uh, like youth unemployment. Um, and then we looked at some structural variables around just the structure of your society, the number of youth in a society, for example, when you have what's called a demographic youth bulge. Uh, and then we, we looked at the literature to see if there's a statistical relationship between those variables and the onset of volatility. That was part one. Part two was we had to also find data for these 2,100 cities that we displayed in the map. Um, so sometimes you have a wonderful proxy variable, but you don't have the underlying data to support it. So in some cases, we constructed our own data. Um, we returned to sentiment analysis to construct a variable on conflict. And we canvassed using GDELT, which is a, a big uh, media uh, mining uh, uh, platform out of Georgetown. We created and constructed our own variables uh, out of ambient data where we didn't have existing administrative data. Um, so the point is that we used two criteria, empirical evidence of the relationship between that variable and volatility at the city scale on the one hand, and also data availability for cities. Just a final point, there is no commensurate data set right now um, that actually does this for cities. And this was quite extraordinary to, to those of us who were involved in doing this research project. Uh, given how important cities are 
in shaping development, in shaping democracy, in shaping the evolution of societies, it was striking that there had been no equivalent data set that had been created. Um, and so we were essentially embarking on this experiment to try to create the first open source, open facing platform to allow people to engage. Uh, but we're always open and, and curious to hear other kinds of variables and suggestions that people might have with accompanying data sets. Awesome. Robert, can you still hear me right now? I can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm, I'm having a little bit of a weird technical glitch. Um, so sorry for everyone who heard Echo or kind of saw two videos of me. I'm not sure why that's happening, but hopefully now it's a little bit better. Um, great. So that was, um, let me go look at some of these other questions. Um, so one of the other things I was thinking about is, you know, you talked a lot about, um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, for the, for the cities that are doing it right, do you see any similarities between them? Is it that, I know you mentioned mayors being kind of like the go-getters. Are there any other similarities across cities that are actually getting it right and doing better? Yeah, I mean, obviously cities in, in the West and so-called industrialized you know, countries um, have, a, have a head start. It took them uh, hundreds of years to, to, in many cases, some cases even thousands of years, to get to an equivalent stage of, let's say, development. Um, many of the cities in the Global South, uh, notably in Latin America and Africa and Asia, are growing at breakneck speed. I mean, uh, you know, the this, this, this scale at which Sao Paulo or, or, or Calcutta or... or um, you know, Lagos uh, or others have grown is far more rapid um, in, in terms of those, than those cities, their counterpart cities in, in, in the West. Uh, so they're facing, I think, some real critical challenges with trying to absorb this fast growing population to create the services and the infrastructure uh, to service them um, and, and to manage that kind of growth without creating ultimately vast slums uh, that spread out and around cities. Um, I think what we're learning though is that um, a lot of cities in the, in the Global South are beginning to adopt new technologies to leapfrog some of the challenges uh, that, they may, that, that other cities may have faced. Um, so they're introducing, for example, new forms of communication infrastructure that don't depend on landlines. Uh, they're investing in renewable energies rather than investing in coal and other polluting uh, uh, energy supplies. Uh, they're, they're looking to mobile apps and other forms of uh, uh, platforms to engage citizens more productively in conversations than simply having a one-way traffic of information. Um, they're incubating private sector and capital uh, together with universities to try, you know, try to innovate and create solutions to some of the problems that are being identified. And I think one of the things that unifies all of these cities that are successful in the north or the south, in the east or the west, uh, is the willingness of the mayors to learn from each other, uh, the willingness of civic leaders to share, even to steal good ideas. Um, and I think you'll hear the most successful mayors talk about that. Um, go out there and rip off other people's ideas. Uh, go and innovate on them. Um, don't, don't get locked in this paradigm that what works in one place necessarily won't work in another. Of course, there needs to be some adaptation, some tailoring, um, and we need to trial some of these tools. But I think cities offer a really fascinating scale and laboratory in which to test things out uh, and to rapidly move to scale. So I think the first, the first lesson is to uh, borrow uh, lend and or steal ideas as quickly as possible. Um, the second, I think, is, is to create uh, incentives for uh, business and universities and think tanks and obviously public servants and others to work together and collaborate. Um, to deal with some of these big problems in cities, both in them and the ones that are coming, you need to have this collaborative approach to move from rust belts to brain belts, as I think some scholars have described it. Um, you know, and the third, I think, is to have good information. I mean, I, 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 that's sort of stating the obvious, uh, but if you don't have information that takes a pulse of what's happening in your city and what's coming down the track, you're flying blind. And some of the most extraordinary innovations and successes, I think, on the city front have been when dashboards and real-time monitoring systems using a combination of administrative and unstructured data have been assembled together uh, to allow city leaders and, and citizens to be able to understand what's actually happening in their city. And, and we have the ability now with processing power uh, and access to various forms of technologies to be able to do that. There's no excuse not to. Uh, fantastic. Um, 
We have a lot more questions, but we're actually out of time. Uh, so Robert, thank you so much. That was um, so informative and uh, I hope inspiring to everyone who was watching. I shared some links in the chat section um, and maybe AC will share them again since we've got some people commenting. Um, for the first link, if you guys like the session, um, please click on the survey link um, and let us know what you thought. We love hearing from you. Um, we love also hearing what topics you'd like for us to cover next. Um, if you're interested in more sessions like this that um, you know are longer, more advanced, um, have more time for question and answer, request an invite for our Experts on Air Premium. Um, and the last link I shared there is to register for our upcoming sessions. And we actually have another session tomorrow with Catherine Moore talking about uh, the future of robotic surgery. So uh, join us for that. Robert, thank you again one more time. Um, I'm bummed that we didn't get through so many of the great questions that we had. So maybe we'll have to bring you back for another one of these. If people want to um, get in touch with me, please just send me an email um, yes. uh, or, or hit my LinkedIn. Um, I saw lots of fabulous questions, including a bunch of technical ones. Uh, and of course, I'm here to uh, you know, provide any feedback or inputs that I can. So please, please do feel free to, to reach out and I'll do my best to get back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you again soon. Bye. Thanks. Ciao. Ciao.